To talk about solutions, we first need to understand some vocabulary surrounding solutions. So first, what is a solution? A solution is defined as a homogeneous mixture consisting of your solvent and your solute. Not very helpful if you don't know the terminology yet though. So first of all, mixture is defined as something that is made of two or more components, but these can vary in proportions. So like a metal alloy can have differing ratios of metals in it. Sweetened tea. Uh, we live in the South. Sweet tea is a very big thing down here. And people can put different ratios of their tea to their sugar to their water in their tea. Solvent and solute are also definitions you need to understand. A solvent is the solution component in the largest amount, usually. And in gen chem, this is usually water. The reason I say usually present in the largest amount is that it is the phase um, the species that does not change phase upon mixing. So if I have two things I'm mixing together and they're both a liquid to start, my solvent is the one that's present in the greater quantity of liquid. But if I have two things I'm mixing together and one's a liquid and one's a solid, and the solid dissolves into the liquid, even if the solid is present in a greater amount, the liquid is still my solvent because it doesn't change phase. So first thing you look at is, are they in different phases? If they are, the species that changes phase is not my solvent. The, spe the species that keeps the same phase is my solvent. If they're in the same phase to start, the species that's in the greater amount, that's present in the greater quantity, is my solvent. And my solute is the opposite. It's the dissolved substances that's usually present in the smaller amount, but it's going, it's going to change phase if a phase needs to be changed. So we can see here a couple different ones. We've got sodium chloride here. And over here you've got... Um, don't remember which molecule this is, but it's a non, um, it's a non-electrolyte, which we'll talk about later in this chapter. It's, I think it's sucrose, but I'm not positive on that anymore. I don't remember. But what we see here is the difference in how these two things dissolve. NaCl is an ionic compound. Sucrose is a molecular compound. So in the NaCl, it's splitting apart this entire crystal structure. Okay, you see that the chlorides are being surrounded, the sodium ions are being surrounded. And I'll go into more depth in each one of these in just a minute. But then on the other one, the sucrose, we can see that sucrose molecules are being surrounded, but the molecule itself is not being broken apart. Okay, but in both of these cases, water is my solvent. In gen chem world, water is often our solvent. It doesn't have to be our solvent, but it often is in gen chem. So, a little more vocabulary. First, concentration. Concentration is a relative term, okay? It's a measure of how much solute I have to my solvent, what ratio I have. What ratio do I have of solvent to sol um, solute to solvent? We have the terms concentrated and dilute, but again, these are relative to one another. Concentrated just means there's a large amount of solute compared to the solvent. And dilute means it's a small amount of solute compared to the solvent. But those are relative to one another as well. It's like using the word very. I remember when I was younger, I'd use the word very a lot. And my teacher once told me that that word is relative to what I was discussing in the first place. So if you know something has more solute particles, it's more concentrated. If something has less solute particles, it's less concentrated. It's more dilute. We're going to use molarity to actually talk about concentration, molarity is defined as the moles of solute per volume of solution in liters. So moles over liters is the way we say it, but it's again, moles of solute over liters of total solution. And the reason it's stated like that is because it means the solvent and solute volume added together in liters. We also have mass percent. Mass percent is the mass of the solute divided by the mass of solution times 100. And ppm is another term that we could use. ppm is parts per million. It's usually grams of solute per 1 million gram of solution. Okay, just some different terms. There are others as well, but these are some of the ones you may see. One thing I really need you to start working on is developing the mental picture of what's going on in solution, okay? So work on developing that imaginary picture in your mind of the atoms and molecules in the solution. This will help you better understand what is actually happening. So here I have copper 2 carbonate. And if I look at it, it just looks like a, you know, a light green 
pale green compound here, and it looks crystalline, so I can tell it's a solid. Symbolically, we do write the formula macroscopically. This is what it looks like to us, but the particulate diagram, what I should be envisioning in my mind is a series of copper 2 plus ions and carbonate ions. And they have opposite charge of each other. There's a one-to-one -one ratio of copper to carbonate, copper 2 plus ions to carbonate ions. So I see that here. I see my copper 2 plus surrounded by my carbonates. I see my carbonates surrounded by my coppers. Okay? So start developing that in your mind because I need you to be able to see in solution what's going on. So when will a solute dissolve? Why does something actually break apart in solution? Why does it actually dissolve? Why, when I put sodium chloride in water, do I now have a salt solution? Why do I have sodium ions floating around and chloride ions floating around? Well, there's a couple things going on here you got to think about. So the formation of the attractive forces between the solvent and solute particles releases energy. We're going to focus more on this in Chem 2, but formation of attractive forces releases energy, okay? So there's some kind of attractive force being formed here. Generally, the formation of a solution, again, solution is your solute-solvent interactions, provides enough energy to break the solute-solvent solute interactions and the solvent-solvent interactions. So we've got lots of interactions going on here, and I'll talk about all of them in a sec. If the attractions between the solute and solvent are strong enough, then the solution will dissolve. The, or the solute will dissolve and the solution will form. Okay, so let's say we've got uh, NaCl. Okay, the reason that Na plus and Cl minus are attracted to each other is an electrostatic attraction. It's an opposite charge thing here. The sodium ions are attracted to the chloride ions. The chloride ions are attracted to the sodium ions, and they build up that 3D array that we've talked about, that 3D crystal structure. In order to break these away from each other, energy has to go in to break apart this attractive force. This is known as my solute-solute interaction. Anytime I'm breaking things apart, energy has to go in. Anytime something is formed, if a bond or attractive force is formed, energy is released. Now, the reason I say bond or attractive force, they are different things. A bond is a type of attractive force, but... Um, the attractive forces between the molecules themselves is something different. It's called an IMF. We're going to learn about them in a future chapter. So I've got to break apart the solute-solute interaction. The other thing I have to do, though, is I've got water, and water is also attracted to each other. So water molecule actually looks like this. And a water molecule is attracted to another water molecule. Water is what we call a polar molecule. So water has a partial negative side and a partial positive side. The oxygen does not share the electron density nicely. So the hydrogens are all partially positive charged and the oxygen is partially negative charged. This is what allows it to dissolve ionic compounds though. Okay, And again, we will spend more time on that throughout the semester. But in order to break apart these attractive forces between the molecules, energy has to go in. And that's what's talking about enough energy to break the solvent solvent interactions so i've got to break apart the solute solute interactions i've got to break apart the solvent solvent interactions and then solute solvent interactions get to form if the amount of energy here is greater then the energy to break apart solute-solute and solvent-solvent then the solution will form. So things that are similar in property 
like to mix together. We'll talk more about this in a future class, but it's called the like dissolves like concept. Things that have similar properties will dissolve each other. This is why ionic compounds will split apart into their individual ions in solution. So, dissolution of ionic compounds. Water molecules surround an ion and pull it off and away from the crystal. The ion enters the solution and is surrounded by the water molecules, which isolate it from the other ions. The resulting solution has freely moving charged particles, which are able to conduct electricity, and this is called your electrolyte. The ions dissociate in solution. So again, our water molecule has a general structure like this, okay? It's got lone pairs in the oxygen there. And the oxygen portion is a negative, partial negative charge. That little delta symbol means partial. The hydrogens are partial positive. So the way it's going to orient itself is that the oxygen atom is going to orient itself towards the positive ions or the cations, in, um, the cation in your system, which in this case happens to be sodium. We can see that here. Here. And here. The oxygens are orienting themselves towards the sodiums because they're positively charged. They're attracted to it. The water molecule surrounds it and then pulls that ion away from the crystal structure. It pulls it away and it pulls it into solution to the point where that ion no longer feels the pull of that ionic crystal anymore. Now it's just a free-flowing ion in solution stabilized by those water molecules. We see the same thing happening with the chloride ions being pulled away. Except in the case of the chloride ion, it's the hydrogens orienting themselves towards the chloride because the hydrogens, again, have that partial positive charge. So it's going to result in these freely moving charged particles throughout your whole solution. It's not that the particles don't want to be together anymore. It's that the amount of energy released when the solution it forms, it gives away more energy, overall more energy than the energy it takes to break apart those crystal structures and break apart the water interactions with itself. And so then they pull the ions so far apart that they can't, they don't sense each other anymore. They don't combine back up. In an ideal world, at least. Okay, so dissolving ionic compounds, dissociation reactions. An ionic compound, which is often called a salt, we will define salt later in this chapter, but a salt is a cation anion combination where the cation is not H plus and the anion is not OH minus. They dissolve in water, okay? This is represented by writing the solid phase as the reactant and the ions that are formed in solution as the product. So that's what you see down here. The nickel two chloride, solid phase, breaking into nickel two plus ions and two moles of chloride ions. Once dissolved, the physical states of the ions is aqueous. AQ again means dissolved in water. Aqueous specifically means water to indicate um, that those ions are in fact dissolved. Again, water is not included in the reaction outside of specifying the phase of the ions because water isn't reacting. Water stabilizing the ions in solution. It's forming interactions with them, yes, and it's pulling away from each other, but it's not really forming, an, it's not an actual reaction that's happening. It's just pulling the ions apart. Make sure your charges balance and also note what's going on here. Um, so again, chloride ions, not Cl2, stuff like that. So let's talk about this. So here I've got nickel two chloride, okay? So that means I've got a nickel two plus and two chloride ions to make up this one species. So when that breaks apart, it shouldn't surprise me that I have one nickel and two chloride ions. I need two chlorides for every one nickel to charge balance it. The charge does have to balance. I have a plus two over here, and I have two negative ones, which gives me an overall zero charge still. But the other thing it says here is to be careful about um, is the chloride ions, not Cl2 gas, okay? If I say chlorine is reacting, that is a diatomic. But chloride and chlorine are not the same thing. We are not forming chlorine gas here. Chlorine gas and nickel are not pairing up here, okay? Be careful with your diatomics. You've got to remember that you've got ions here. It's an ion that's happening. It's an ion that's in solution. It's not your diatomic at this point. And then dissolving molecular solids. Again, this is a dis dissolution only. In the previous example, we're forming ions. So this is an ionization pro process. Meaning ions are being formed. 
So dissolving it and dissociating it results in ions. Down here, it's only dissolving them. It's not forming any ions. So if I've got sucrose solid going to sucrose aqueous, no ions are formed. No covalent bonds are broken. The sugar molecule, your sucrose molecule down here, has a series of positive and negative sides to it, depending on what's aimed where. So anytime you see red, red represents oxygen. Um, an oxygen atom, white represents a hydrogen atom, and black represents a carbon atom. So you can see, for example, here, this represents an oxygen, so it's aiming towards the hydrogen of a water molecule. This represents a hydrogen, so it's aiming towards the oxygen portion of a water molecule. The water molecules are still going to break apart the molecules from one another. So the energy that goes in is breaking apart molecules. From one another. But it's not breaking up the molecule itself. So it's just breaking apart the interactions of the molecules to one another. And then those molecules then in turn form interactions with the water molecule or whatever your solvent may be. And those interactions that um, are formed are stabilizing the solution. They're stabilizing these compounds, allowing them to dissolve. Mm -hmm.